So, have you seen the latest adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma? It was put out in 2020, and I feel like there are so many different opinions about this movie, but today I'm going to be giving you mine in this review of Emma 2020. My name is Ellie Dashwood, and this is my channel where I talk about history, classic literature, and writing. If you like any of those things, please subscribe. The opinions about Emma 2020 are so polarized. It either is the extreme side of, oh, it's the best movie ever made, or the exact opposite of Emma 2020 classifies as one of the catastrophes of 2020. First, I want to dive into an analysis of it. So first, just talking about visually, this film is absolutely stunningly gorgeous, but I feel like it's incredibly stylized and unrealistic. For example, if you look at Pride and Prejudice 2005, that, which is a stunning film too, they did it in this very natural, organic way that was super believable. Meanwhile, Emma feels like a Tim Burton movie meets someone's art school graduate project. We see that through the sets, through the color scheme, there's a very definite color scheme running through every single scene of that movie. Overall, it is very, very pretty. The other thing I want to talk about is that they really were going for a comical perspective of Emma a little bit. I noticed it especially earlier in the film in certain scenes, such as when she's holding the baby. They went to extremes in this movie. Jane Austen is always actually kind of comical, but she does it in this very like understated, subtle way. Well, this movie definitely brought that out in an extreme form. They left all subtlety at the door and just went for it. And the servants, I feel like the servants were partially there for comic effect, but I feel like there was some underlying social commentary they were trying to give about how the rich people are really spoiled and they're just like demanding on their servants and ordering them around and constantly waited on. And while I understand that that's what they were trying to portray, I feel like it was done in the super unrealistic way. Because really, servants were workers who had real jobs. They had real responsibilities. They had duties. They just did not stand around all day waiting for people to give them orders. They already had their orders. That's why if somebody wants one of them, they have to ring a bell because they're busy. That's the whole point of servants. Well, meanwhile, it seems like the servants in this version of Emma stand there 90% of their life. So one of the great things about Jane Austen movies is a lot of them all have very stereotypical parts. There's always the ridiculous clergyman, the dad who's not always helpful when it comes to romance, or the untrustable rogue. So wouldn't it be great if while watching your favorite Jane Austen film, you could play Jane Austen bingo, where the squares are Jane Austen tropes and you can play against your family and friends and see who wins first? Well, guess what? I made Jane Austen bingo for you. You can download a free printable PDF pack of Jane Austen bingo cards by signing up for my newsletter from the link in the description below. It is very fun if I do say so myself. Admittedly, I made it so I might be slightly biased, but definitely get your free Jane Austen bingo pack today by signing up for my newsletter in the link below, like I already said. So next up, I want to talk about, I think the biggest issue most people have with this movie, which is Emma herself. Now, the characterization of Emma is a perfect example of them taking something to the extreme and adapting it to modern sensibilities. Because when we look at Emma that Jane Austen wrote, I feel like basically she's this good-hearted girl who has been a bit spoiled in her childhood. She thinks too well of herself, but overall she's 90% good and cares about other people and wants to be helpful and loving. And I think that's why people love Emma. So I I feel like they came into this version and were like, oh, well, it says she's arrogant and stuck up and has all these lessons to learn. Let's make her the most sourest brat on the entire planet. Because if I described a person in 2020 the way they describe Emma, this is what I think she would look like. Now, I think we have to go back to realizing that Jane Austen's Regency world had an entirely different scale of morality and character and what people should be like. So, I'm going to give you an example of this. 
which is the famous hand flex scene from Pride and Prejudice 2005, where, you know, Darcy helps Elizabeth get into the carriage and their hands touch and then his hand flexes when he walks away because he's like, oh, I touched Elizabeth. So some Regency people would be like, oh, Elizabeth and Darcy, which is totally getting physical. This is quite scandalous. Well, I feel like too in Regency times, they had the getting physical level of Lydia running away with Wickham and shacking up in London. So their getting physical scale went from hand touch to shacking up in London. Okay. So thinking about this scale, for example, with Emma's personality of being sort of arrogant and stuck up, we have arrogant and stuck up to being the worst person alive <laughs> and the most sour ever. See how there's a scale there? So Emma's personality flaws were more like hand flex 2005 version of character defects and they came in in this Emma 2020 and made her the equivalent of Lydia shocking up with Wickham in London defects. They did this because in 2020, our era, we don't really have hand flex, right? And if people are getting physical in movies in 2020, they're literally shocking up in London together. When they read in this character, they translated it through the perspective of 2020, which I feel like greatly distorted who she was and made her kind of really unlikable for a lot of the movie. This caused a problem with Emma's personality overall because it caused a contradictory, confusing situation that required a complete suspension of disbelief to accept. Because here we have them trying to adapt Emma of the book, who acts and behaves in a very good-hearted way, especially in a lot of the vital scenes of the book. And they're trying to make her look at, like this completely stuck-up brat. But then it's almost like she has to have this dual personality of where she's a stuck-up brat most of the scenes, and then all of a sudden a major scene like I talked about would come along, and she had to completely flip her personality to behave like Emma did in the book. And then she like flips back <laughs> to being a stuck-up brat and continues. It requires yeah, I mean, to essentially be like, I see what they did there. It doesn't work, but I'm just gonna have to accept this, that that's what they did. Oh, like, too, they took Emma's overall story arc and they changed it in an interesting way. Throughout the entire book of Emma, she learns lessons gradually as she comes across a different important mistake she makes in her life, which I feel like is what we do as humans, right? We learn this lesson and then we learn that lesson and then we learn this lesson. Where Emma in the movie sort of sails through a lot of the lessons. For example, Harriet's first heartbreak over Mr. Elton, she's not that upset about it. Even Harriet doesn't seem that upset about it, honestly. So all of this doesn't phase her. That definitely had major effects on her in the book until the scene after Box Hill, which is when she's very mean to Miss Bates and Mr. Knightley lectures her. And so then all of a sudden she totally has all of the life lessons all at once. And she's just so heartbroken about it. That created a very unnatural story arc and something that was definitely different from the book. And it also caused a lot of deviations from the book because again, I think they were trying to make it more acceptable to our modern sensibilities. I think we especially see this from the point where Mr. Knightley proposes on. She goes and she directly interferes with Robert Martin's second proposal by being like, hey, I have to confess to you and you should go propose. That does not happen in the book. And I don't think think it would happen in Regency England. And then again, Emma's personality problems presented themselves in the Emma Knightley relationship, which was Knightley loves Emma because her heart's basically good in the book. And yes, he lectures her a lot on her faults, but as imperfect humans, we all have many faults. Now, in this movie, I'm just like, why does he like Emma? On what planet does Mr. Knightley like this girl who acts like this? And I was watching the movie with my sister and she agreed. It's like, what on earth does Mr. Knightley see in this version of Emma? And I think that significantly hurt their romance in the movie, at least for me. Also, Emma's a lot more flippant and rude to Mr. Knightley in this version. Now let's talk about Mr. Knightley for a minute 
in it. I feel like Mr. Knightley's character development was very low. We didn't get to see a lot of those great defining moments where he is the definition of a gentleman. I feel like when I think of Knightley, that's what I think of. He is 100% what a gentleman should be, and I don't think we saw that in this movie. But you know what we did see in this movie? Mr. Knightley's butt. Why? Who was like, you know what Emma needs? A naked Mr. Knightley, right? It's brilliant. My mom pointed this out, which is they were trying to get the rating score up on Emma. Because if you take out the, I don't know, half a second scene of Mr. Knightley changing his clothes and being naked, there's nothing else that would have raised the ranking of Emma from G to PG-13. And so I feel like some movies do this, they'll throw in a cuss word here or there in order to up their ranking because apparently people don't want to see rated G movies. I don't know. G movies are the best, guys. So too, if you look at the romantic misunderstandings or development in this movie in general, it's very hard to understand if you don't know the background of Emma. For example, Mr. Churchill and Emma flirt a lot more, I think, in the book and in other versions of Emma that you understand why Mr. Knightley thinks that Emma likes Mr. Churchill. But in this one, it's so subtle that you could miss it. And then it's the same thing with Mr. Elton. Mr. Elton hitting on Emma is so subtle, you could miss it. And I feel like that greatly hurts the film. Again, let's talk about deviations in the Emma Knightley relationship, such as their very romantic dance at the ball. And then he runs after her all the way home. And they have this moment where you feel like they both know they like each other. But then all of a sudden it's like, wait, no, Mr. Knightley thinks that she likes Mr. Churchill and Emma thinks that he likes Harriet. But really, I feel like after that whole ball scene, that's not really believable. It's like, first of all, both of those things are so subtle while the ball scene is so extreme. How could you be confused? right? And so I feel like their deviations and extremes or subtlety of leaving things out definitely hurts the understanding of the plot line. So also, I just want to take a minute and talk about Jane Fairfax, who comes off in this version as very stuck up and antagonistic towards Emma versus usually being a shy, reclusive person who's hiding a secret and is stressed out. Because if you read the final scene between Jane Fairfax and Emma in the book, that scene could never happen between the Jane and the Emma of Emma 2020. And I don't really understand why they did this to Jane Fairfax, except for the fact that I feel like they were trying to maybe show her as a more empowered version of Jane because Jane, I feel like, can come off as very passive in the book. But then again, Jane Austen did not write an empowered Jane Fairfax, now did she? No. Between that and also how Harriet's storyline ends, Harriet, I feel like, is also much more empowered by the end of this movie than she is by the book. And the change in Emma, where she's suddenly adopting more modern sensibilities. I feel like all of this just shows that the movie makers were not happy with the way that Jane Austen ended Emma, and they wanted a more modern finish to the story. The final thing I'm going to talk about the storyline, just one major thing, which is all the kissing at the end. It's like, this is the Emma where everyone's making out in the end of the movie. But seriously, I think it was a very interesting choice to end it that way. So overall, I ended up liking this movie more than I thought I would. And I feel like part of that came from the fact that I went into watching it with such low expectations. I was like, I'm going to 100% hate this. That when I only like 70% hated it, I was like, oh wow, that was surprisingly good. The more I watch it, the more I like it. But it requires me again to have this complete suspension of disbelief that this characterization of Emma is even humanly possible in one person. It also requires me to accept the highly stylized look and just go with it. And again, I think it does require an understanding of Emma's true storyline to fill in the gaps of the confusing parts. But of course, my favorite version of Emma will always be BBC's Emma 2009, unless the BBC puts out an even better version, which I don't know if they possibly can. So let me know in the comments below what you think of Emma 2020 and what is your favorite version of Emma. Again, my name is Ellie Dashwood. This is my channel and keep being awesome because 
you're awesome.